you. We are uh, fortunate to, uh, to have uh, three speakers to give a presentation on Islamic uh, capital market and infrastructure. Uh, today with us, we have Dr. Masud Janaki, Director Head and Islamic Capital Markets from Bank of London and Middle East. And we also have with us uh, Mr. Walid Saradi, Assistant General Manage Manager, Head and Islamic Finance from Sumitomo, Misu Banking Corporation Europe. And also Ms. Chiren uh, Ramsley, from Head of the Fixed Income Products from London Stock Exchange. Without uh, wasting much of the time, I would like uh, to invite Ms. Chiren to give the first presentation. Thank you very much for that, that kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here talking about the London Stock Exchange and the London Capital Markets for Islamic Finance. Um, what I'd like to do today, I have a few slides, but because we're quite a small group, I think we can interact in it. I'm quite happy to take questions throughout. I look after our markets for fixed income at the London Stock Exchange. Um, that covers, because of the legal structure um, in the UK, that covers Islamic Finance, particularly Sukuk. But it also covers another uh, quite a wide range of other exchange traded products that I'll talk a bit about today. So that's our equity market for small and growing companies. Many Islamic financial institutions have listed on that market. And it also covers on very, very gro high growth um, segments for exchange traded funds and structured products. Now what I'd like to do really um, is set the scene and talk a bit about the development. I know today's session is about the development of capital market structures. Um, and I thought it might be helpful really just to, to, to tie into the London experience and, uh, and show how over a number of years London has established itself as a centre of Islamic finance and really um, to show from our experience how we've done that. Now, London, of course, has for, for many centuries been a centre um, of trade and a centre of innovation. Um, and the development of the Islamic capital markets in the UK and in London really have been a continuation um, of that. Obviously, London offers um, a considerable pool of very, very deep institutional liquidity. Um, it's one of, if not the leading international financial centre. It's a crossroads, really, for a large pool um, of, uh, of capital um, and liquidity. And our Islamic markets really are benefiting from the wider, deeper markets of, of the London conventional markets. Now, in terms of setting the scene for where the, where the UK and London is at the moment, we have more Islamic banks um, and more um, Sharia compliance institutions than any other Western centre. And London really has taken a lead in terms of <coughs> developing its, its, its capital markets and its Islamic violence offering. There are now over 20 banks providing Islamic financial services. That includes the dedicated Islamic banks and, of course, the, the, the windows of conventional banks offering, uh, offering services. And it's really been the commitment of the UK government and key London market participants, so the conventional banks, the Islamic banks, the London Stock Exchange, um, and HM and the Treasury, to make the London market appealing and um, really to work through, through some of the practicalities for making it possible to do Islamic financial transactions in London. And it's really been a succession of legislative and tax treatment, uh, tax changes to make it possible for issuers to come to the London market and build um, sophisticated transactions which will appeal to um, um, Islamic investors, investors who are looking for Sharia compliance um, solutions. Now, in 2003, um, the UK government introduced legislation to change stamp duty land, land tax, um, and there's been a number of successive changes since then, further in 2005 and 2006, and finance tax in 2007 2008. So you can see um, it was really a very, very strong commitment from the UK government um, to change the existing UK legis legislative and tax structure to make it possible to do Islamic financial transactions. And the underlying theme and principle behind this is absolutely that um, those wishing to structure Sharia compliant solutions shouldn't be disadvantaged because of the UK tax um, and legal structure. And one of the particular issues with, with stamp duty 
um, land tax in the UK, obviously because many Sukuk transactions are based on physical assets and land transactions. It often occurred that in the structuring of a Sukuk um, transaction, which was based on land, um, it would involve the issue of paying tax twice. And obviously, that's, that's not ideal in terms of managing the costs of a transaction. Um, so that was lifted in, the, in, these, in these various changes to um, uh, the regulatory structure. Um, now, uh, things have moved um, in terms of the announcements that have been made at this, uh, this very important forum. Um, and you'll have seen earlier this week the Prime Minister's announcement um, that the UK government will be looking at um, a Sukuk issue or Sukuk guilt. Hugely positive development um, for the market, and it's been widely you know, been greeted really with, with delight by um, the Islamic banks and the conventional banks um, in London. We've seen huge appetite um, for such a transaction in terms of the impact that it will have on liquidity. Um, and that's always been one of the key themes about perhaps one of the key drivers which will facilitate and support Islamic finance in the UK. I just um, what I'd like to do now, really, is to talk about, I've, I've tried to set the scene of what the UK government has done in terms of the, the underlying infrastructure, legal infrastructure, if you like, to support Islamic finance in the UK. And that's been a very deep commitment to supporting and attracting this business in London. What we've done at the London Stock Exchange is we have a number of um, very, very um, uh, key international markets, conventional markets, um, and what we've done is to make available offerings for Islamic financial institutions to use those markets to benefit from the distribution and the reach of the London Stock Exchange's conventional markets, that deep pool of liquidity, that large in international institutional investor base, and to benefit from that for Islamic transactions. Now, in the first instance, what um, companies can do is they can list on the London Stock Exchange. Now, the London Stock Exchange has two um, main equity markets for companies who want to, to raise capital through, um, through, through raising equity. And perhaps the one that's been used the most is the alternative investment market, or AIM market. It's actually the most successful uh, market for growth companies, SMEs, in the world. There's more companies listed than any other SME market. And really, it's a, it's a starting ground for companies who are looking to, to raise capital through the London international investor base. Now, there have been four Islamic institutional, um, Islamic financial institutions which have had their shares quoted on AIM. And AIM is often referred to as the junior market, as a starting ground for companies. Um, it allows them to, to, um, uh, to come to market to meet the listing requirements um, of, a, of a more flexible uh, market. And many often, as they grow um, and achieve funding through the AIM market, then, then we'll move on to the main markets um, of the London Stock Exchange. And what it does is it offers flexibility in terms of the admission um, criteria. So companies coming to the London Stock Exchange's AIM market don't have to meet all of the very, very detailed disclosure and transparency requirements that other companies do. Obviously, it's an exchange regulated market and it's done to very, very high standards. But it doesn't mean a full um, EU compliant prospectus um, and the market is actually regulated by the London Stock Exchange um, rather than um, a pan-European uh, regulator or by the listing authority. So it's been appealing to Islamic financial institutions looking to raise capital to have their shares quoted um, on the alternative investment market. Clearly, when we're talking about Islamic <laughs> instruments, um, it's generally Sukuk that we're, we're talking about, often described as Islamic bonds. We've seen the announcement earlier this week about the, um, the potential Islamic guilt um, the government is looking to issue. The London Stock Exchange is the leading market for the listing of Sukuk. Um, we have more Sukuk listed on our markets than any other exchange. And we've done that. Um, because London offers access to a large pool of deep institutional liquidity, but also because of the high standards of listening and transparency for which the London Stock Exchange is known. What we've seen is that many investors prefer a London Stock Exchange listing, they prefer the profile of listing a Suffolk bond on the London Stock Exchange 
transparency in terms of the documentation requirements, I mean just the reach in terms of the international investors that it offers access to. Many pension funds um, and asset managers have mandates that they can only, um, they can only invest in listed um, securities. Um, and that's why it's important that bonds are listed um, on a recognised investment exchange or regulated market like the London Stock Exchange. And for many international investors, um, if you like that London Stock Exchange brand, um, it, it is quite important, and really just in terms of the distribution of the London <coughs> Stock Exchange's pricing feeds of the range of its members um, and its trading members, um, that, that's, that's quite important. Now we offer a flexibility on the London Stock Exchange for, for our debt markets and Sukuk, as I've mentioned, um, because of the UK legal structure where Sukuk bonds are classified as alternative finance um, investment bonds and legally speaking they are treated as fixed income instruments, they, are, they operate within our, our bond markets. So we have two markets for the listing of Sukuk. The main market, which is, if you like, the London Stock Exchange's premium market, it's um, EU regulated, it's uh, the highest standards of disclosure and transparency. We also have the professional securities market, and this has been quite appealing for international issuers coming to market because, because it offers them flexibility in terms of the ongoing and continuing disclosure. It means they can report to domestic gap rather than IFRS. Um, there's not a requirement for full 300 page prospectus that are listing particulars, but it's still a listed market. It's still regulated by um, the FCA and the UK Listing Authority, um, and of course, subject to all of the monitoring and supervision of the London Stock Exchange. Now, just really to run through, you may be familiar with the, with the, with the types of stock transactions that have come to market. I think what I would highlight. <coughs> is that we've seen a number of milestones as new transactions have come to market, both from sovereign um, and corporate um, issuers. Where we've seen is that issuer base is expanding as more and more um, companies and governments look to tap um, the Sukuk, so the Islamic bond market, rather than using conventional structures. Well, obviously, there's always a place for companies to, to use both and many many um, Islamic institutions and Islamic governments are still doing that, issuing both conventional and Sukuk instruments. <coughs> in terms of the timeline, I just point out in terms of interest, the, uh, the GE Capital Sukuk was an interesting structure because the US corporate issuer, so that was the first um, US corporate um, Islamic bond that came to market, and what we saw there in the way that it was positioned um, of interest was that um, they were actively targeting conventional investors to bring liquidity into that sort of transaction. And I think that's where we would see the further development of Islamic finance um, in the London market. It's pulling in not only investors who are looking for Sharia compliant um, instruments, but conventional investors who see the attraction um, of these particular instruments. All of that will help in terms of building liquidity, um, and particularly important in terms of building secondary market liquidity. Because what we found is there's actually a shortage of supply um, for, for Sukuk um, and many investors in Sukuk tend to be buying, naturally buy and hold. Um, it's that when a Sukuk is issued to the market, investors tend to keep hold of it uh, because there's unlimited supply and because naturally um, they tend to be conservative with their investment decisions. So that means in the secondary market for those looking to, to buy and sell, it sometimes can be difficult. But as more and more conventional banks start looking to provide continuous secondary market quoting in this, that pulls in additional liquidity and it all helps in terms of the turnover and the availability of these securities. Particularly um, in the way that the announcement of the UK government's um, sukuk issue has been received is that it, um, in terms of the impact that it will have on sukuk liquidity um, in the secondary market and that it will facilitate further issuance by UK corporates and other international um, and international corporates. It really, the aim is to open up the Sukuk market to a wider range of issuers, a wider range of governments and corporates coming to market. So it opens up. What we're hearing from investors is that they need more supply um, of, of Sukuk bonds. So it's an important source of financing um, for companies. And we're doing... Uh, it's an important initiative for us at the London Stock Exchange in terms of supporting that liquidity 
and supporting issuers coming to market who want to tap that large London institutional investor base. Now, there are other range of um, uh, Islamic financial products that we offer on the London Stock Exchange. I think the key ones are equity capital raising through the AIM market or the main market. I talk about the Suffolk mark market, which is the, the key <laughs> Islamic financial market. But there are other new and growing opportunities for Islamic financial institutions who want to issue products which are Sharia compliant. Um, our exchange trade funds market, the London Stock Exchange, is the largest in Europe and it's really been one of the growth stories that we've seen. We've found that during the financial crisis, you know, from 2008-2009 onwards, our exchange trade fund market was one of the markets that continued to show sustained growth. And I, I should have put a chart in, but our ETF market, um, the growth of it just, it just keeps going um, like that. And it's particularly of interest for um, Islamic financial institutions and um, investors looking for Sharia compliant solutions is that there are a number of structures which already track Islamic indices. Um, and I would say really that I think the structure of an ETF responds very much to some of the key principles of Islamic finance. You've got transparency and openness. So for many fund structures, you will only see pricing perhaps once a day you won't see a market maker quoting throughout the day. You may not have a full prospectus which gives you all the details of the structure of the fund. An ETF, naturally, whether it's tracking an Islamic index or a conventional index, is a highly transparent product. You will have a detailed prospectus which fully runs through how the product works, what the investment um, um, aims are, how it will respond to, to various market conditions. You will know exactly what that fund is invested in and how it's invested because there are a number of different structures and it's all completely transparent. And the market actually itself has worked to in, in, introduce even greater levels of transparency. Um, many, um, many issuers publish details of the collateral arrangements. They will publish detailed information on any swap structures or physical investment um, in the securities. And I think that's quite important in terms of just Putting it in the context of Islamic finance, it's pretty much the most transparent fund structure um, you can get. And there are an increasing number of Sharia compliant solutions available. So we have two issuers in our market who issue traditional equity index um, ETFs. So these are indices which have been screened to make sure all the companies who are constituents of that index are, are Sharia compliant. And we're increasingly seeing um, interest in commodity products. Now these are not structured as funds. Um, they're actually structured as not. And what they do is they give exposure to underlying commodities such as gold. Um, and perhaps an interesting factor of this is one of, one of the most actively traded exchange trade products on the London Stock Exchange are the gold products. These are, these are not that track gold. And they're appealing for investors because not all investors have access to the gold markets or other commodity markets. What this does, it means, is that investors can trade just like trading share on the London Stock Exchange. They can access the gold price. They can do it in, a, in small size or they can do it in very, very large institutional size. Now, since the launch of the commodities market on the London Stock Exchange almost what, a decade ago now, the gold products have always been the most heavily traded. And these have been tra traded by conventional investors. But what we've seen is there's been such demand um, from um, Islamic um, asset managers from sovereign wealth funds for, to be able to access these products and for them to be Sharia compliant. But the issuers of those products have actually gone and made sure that they were Sharia compliant, that they were structured in a way to respond to that investor need. So I think it's really that shows how the needs of Islamic investors and the requirements um, of Islamic financial institutions can actually have an impact on the conventional market that a product will be structured conventional product with deep liquidity will be structured so that it meets the needs of those investors. And I think it ties into really the, the, the theme that I'm trying to bring out about the conventional markets in London and that deep liquidity and that deep, um, uh, that deep market distribution. There are benefits um, for, for linking those with the Islamic markets really and, and, and offering all the benefits of those conventional uh, markets to Sharia compliant um, uh, products. Now, our Sukuk market on the London Stock Exchange is, is an institutional market. All, all of those securities, when they've been issued, they've been issued to wholesale investors. 
and any secondary market trading um, is done by large institutions. What we've seen a trend in our conventional market is a growing appetite for retail investors to become involved. Now, there are many large um, uh, Muslim populations in Europe. Um, they will increasingly start to demand Sharia compliance investment products. And we see potential for companies really to come and tap that retail, that growing retail, that growing private investor appetite for Sharia compliant products. Now, in the conventional space, about four years ago, we launched a new retail bond market for conventional investors, and we've been delighted with the phenom phenomenal success of this market. It really came about because the UK, for, for private investors, retail investors, it has been a predominantly an equity-based investment culture. But with various market conditions and the financial crisis, we saw many UK-based private investors looking for access to fixed income. They like the regular payment streams. They like the security of a bond structure rather than the volatility of equity. And we saw huge inflows into fixed income products by private investors. At the same time, we saw that companies who were looking to access capital were finding it more difficult. Bank lending um, had become more restricted. In particular, for smaller and medium-sized companies, they were looking for resources of capital. So what we did at the London Stock Exchange is we launched a retail bond market. And what we're aiming to do at the exchange and what we do with all our markets really is about putting people who are looking for capital in touch with people who, who have it and who are looking to invest. And that's what we did. So we launched a retail bond market um, with market makers quality on screen. And what that allowed was companies who are looking for capital to it allowed them to diversify their investor base and allow companies to come to market, issue retail bonds, and respond to that demand. And what we see is potentially um, that there is possibility for suck up issues to come to this market as well. Now, um, it's a very highly transparent market, which again responds to the needs of um, key principles of Islamic finance. We have 11 market makers who are quoting in retail bonds um, on the platform and that these are, these are conventional banks, some of them smaller specialist liquidity providing houses um, and the main UK banks and they are actively quoting in retail bonds. I think uh, I have some key, key figures on the market. Well in any case, we've had 39 retail bonds that come to market um, just over 3.6 billion has been raised through, through these transactions and really what's appealing to many of the companies who look to come and tap this market is the flexibility of funding. So I've mentioned diversification. It means that a company is not reliant on their bank for lending. They're not reliant necessarily on coming to the wholesale market and a small group of um, um, uh, uh, professional institutional investors. It means they can come and tap that retail investor appetite. And they can do it in terms of flexible sizing as well. So the retail bonds that we've seen come to market range from 25 to 35 million issues, from really a small size and far too small for coming to the institutional market, up to 280 to 300 million. So there's definitely flexibility in the issue sizes um, for companies that come to this market. And it's been particularly appealing for medium-sized companies who have may have um, less investigative pricing when it comes to bank financing who may be too small in terms of their funding requirements to, um, to access the wholesale markets. Really what we're aiming to do at the London Stock Exchange is just to facilitate that interaction between new sources of capital, in this case retail bonds, um, and, and, and companies looking to come to market. Now we've not seen a Sukuk issue on the retail bond market, but that seems to be the next logical step in the, uh, the expansion of our Islamic finance offering. We have a large institutional sukuk market, we have a growing ETF market, we have equity markets that respond very well to the needs of Islamic finance. Um, what we'd like to do really is open that up to, to private investors and respond to the growing appetite from, from Muslim investors in, in the UK and Europe um, and offer them the transparency and the liquidity and the access that the London Stock Exchange markets um, offer. So I think I'm, I'm running out of time. It's really a lightning overview. And what I, what I really wanted to do was to show 
the progressive nature of the changes that the UK has made to facilitate Islamic finance, how at the London Stock Exchange we've tried to respond to the various needs of different types of investors and different types of companies um, coming to market and what that outlook might be in terms of shifting demand and new opportunities for Islamic finance. I'm not sure if we have any time for questions, but I'd be quite happy to, to take any questions now. And I'll be available after the session if, there's, if there are other points that you'd like to discuss. We have a lot of information on Islamic finance available on the London Stock Exchange website. We have a fact sheet um, which just gives an overview of the key points that I've been discussing. But um, thank you very much for your attention this morning. Um, and I will, without further ado, I'll hand over to our next speaker. Thank you. I would like to invite Mr. Wale for his presentation. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. For those of you who were here yesterday, there was a session with, um, I believe, um, in the afternoon. Uh, which was about uh, how different centers of Islamic finance may be working together and there was a good, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, panel talking about it. There was one particular question about infrastructure that was, that was asked and it was about uh, the appetite potentially seen uh, amongst the Islamic investors community and by investors that could be taken to mean bankers and equity investors. How attracted are they to infrastructure-related investments and infrastructure-related developments? Especially in the case where we're talking about uh, very, uh, the very large areas of the Middle East or Southeast Asia or the overall Muslim world who clearly have uh, a lot uh, in terms of requirements for further infrastructure in certain countries and certain places, there are very ambitious programs. In others, there's potentially attempts to have uh, further development put in place. But the, 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 the main theme here is there's a lot of infrastructure coming online uh, in various areas of the Muslim world and beyond. And uh, here in the UK, for example, and encouraged by the announcement of the Prime Minister two days ago, there's also further talk about potentially attracting <coughs> Islamic investors, financiers, into UK infrastructure financing, another growing area where there are very large programs, whether it's in transportation or social infrastructure or energy related. So with, with that sort of framework, uh, the idea is to talk to you a little bit about what we've seen at the <coughs> Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation. We are a bank that is uh, very much focused on infrastructure, whether in the Middle East or here in the UK as well, uh, specifically in the public-private uh, partnership schemes that the government has relied on to uh, develop most of the UK infrastructure over the last 20 years, I guess. So uh, I'm not too sure how I'm operating my... Sorry. Okay. This is not... Up to date, and I'm sorry about that. It stops in 2012. 2013 has been another active year, but uh, this is just to show you. And we're taking we're taking the GCC as an example here. So I have to apologize for um, people from Malaysia who have a, a a very vibrant Islamic finance market, and we're all aware of the actually Sukuk activities that's going, which is ahead of other markets in the infrastructure world. But uh, I'm sort of used it just as an illustration of a particular region where Islamic finance is very, uh, very uh, central to the banking activities. And just to give an example about how the, the, the out of total uh, project finance activities, how much is being done in a Sharia compliant manner up to 2012. And, and, and you see that, forget about 2011, it was a specifically depressed year as project finance uh, activities take a long gestation time, so by 2011 we saw the product of things that were effectively created or con uh, conceptualized in 2008, uh, not a great year. But just to, just to illustrate the fact that this is growing, you see, you, you see in 2012 it's pretty much there in terms of equality with, uh, with conventional financing, but that's very important. 
And we've also seen the beginning of the scoop in that market as well. Uh, in terms of sectors where this is going, and again, because potentially it's the GCC as well, there will be sort of further bias towards energy, but it's mainly energy. Noting as well that infrastructure in terms of uh, transportation, social infrastructure, water-related infrastructure should be coming up uh, also <coughs> soon. So what we know in, in, in general, okay, it is now, it is now pretty much an established component of, uh, of project financing. When we talk about Islamic financing in the world of project financing, it's pretty much established in, in areas where Islamic <coughs> finance is central, mainly the GCC and Southeast Asia. The, the, this is a clear reality now. Uh, we've seen recently activities whereby <coughs> the entire large project uh, is being financed in Sharia compliant manner. For the longest time, uh, the more classical or typical integration of Islamic finance and project financing was through a particular Islamic tranche that would come and coexist alongside the conventional tranche. And that model still, still, still uh, flourishes in, in many places. But we've also seen situations where our projects are entirely funded in Sharia compliant land. And I'll be talking about one of them uh, soon. We've also realized that I, I use the word standardized, but put not in front of it. Because on one hand, uh, the, the structures, the Sharia compliant structure, used in a more complex environment, which is project financing, as opposed to more, more a relatively straightforward arrangement that are corporate lending type arrangement. The structures, the Sharia compliant structures, are getting better established. I mean, we still can't talk about them being standardized. And again, yesterday, for those of you who were here, there was a, a specific panel about the, the harmonization of Sharia standards across different markets. Um, and I think this remains an open debate. Personally, I do believe it will remain an open debate for, for a long time. But yet, we're coming to situations whereby certain project financing types are being pretty much understood to have bedded down in a certain manner, specifically using the Sasna and Bijara, just, just, just an example. Uh, and also, importantly, as I mentioned, and as we mentioned in the case of Malaysia, more than the GCC, the emergence of the Sukuk in that, in that area, the project Sukuk in that area, and that would be definitely a big theme over the next years. The same way we see it being a big theme in terms of project bonds in the conventional world, uh, an equivalent of this is, is, is firmly developing in the, in the Islamic finance world as well. Just, this is an example I wanted to talk about. We've, uh, we were privileged enough to be the financial advisor to this particular project to close that closed last year. It is the project of the airport. It's not the new airport because there's, it's an extension and the creation of a new terminal, so to speak, in the city of Medina, Medina, Manawa, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, it is a PPP-based, a public partner, a public-private partnership uh, concession agreement uh, given by the Saudi authorities, in this case the General Authority of Civil Aviation, to a bidder, <coughs> to a pro private sector bidder, uh, to build, de develop, build, operate, and then return 25 years later to the new airport of Medina. Uh, it's a landmark, definitely a landmark uh, project. As I said, the general authority of uh, civil aviation was the the uh, uh, the uh, concession giving party. Uh, the initiative came because the airport of Medina was a small airport in a city that has a very captive, understandably very captive, unique uh, traffic of pilgrims mainly, and also in growing Saudi city. Uh, by 2010, that airport was growing very very rapidly. The, I think. It Growing at around 20% on on, on on annual basis, it, it has surpassed the five million passenger per year, and effectively it was better, more and more seen as the, the main port, and which it is obviously of the uh, what in certain areas is referred to as religious tourism in Saudi Arabia as, as it's really the pilgrimage for Hajj and, and, and Umrah specifically, uh, which is a a very big activity for the Saudi state. Start with. Uh, we were working with uh, with one of the bidders, 
It's the TBA mm -hmm. Consortium, which is made up of uh, TAV Airports of Turkey, who are the uh, current uh, operators of Istanbul Airport, for example, and many other airports in Turkey and beyond, uh, with Saudi OJ, a, a large Saudi contractor, as well as Al Raji Holdings, again, a very well established big business institution in Saudi Arabia with uh, diverse uh, interests. Uh, in 2011, the project was uh, was given, or the consort, the concession was was given to this particular consortium we were working with, and we acted as financial advisor for during uh, bidding time and for execution as well. Uh, there were a couple of very interesting features in, in this particular uh, transaction. Uh, when it came down to financing such a, such a transaction, obviously this, is, this, is, this was done on a capital mix of debt and equity. The equity is very straightforward. When it came down to setting up the debt package that will go as a project financing for such a project, uh, it, it was clearly obvious that this will be done as a Sharia compliant basis, even if it's only for the fact, if it, if, even if it's only for the fact that it's the airport of uh, Medina specifically. And I think you know, everyone will, was very clear on the fact that this will be a Sharia compliant uh, debt package. Uh, this was a, a BTO, as in build, transfer, and operate, given by the Saudi government to the winning bidder. And there was a bit of a, uh, a sting in the tail, so to speak, in that, because as opposed to the typical BOT, where you build, operate, and then turn over to the authorities, this was a case of then they turn it over and then you have the rights to operate it. It is potentially not that surprising because this is a national asset with a lot of security implications around it. So in, in actually beyond Saudi Arabia, it, it, I understood as I knew little about the airport industry before 2011 that this is also a practice that can, can be found in, in different parts of the world because of the important national importance and sensitivity of airports as, as, as an asset, as a, national, as a national asset. Now, an issue here then is in terms of setting up a Sharia compliance structure is you're left then, as, as we all know, uh, typically Sharia compliant uh, funding uh, structure are underpinned by a real asset. Even if it's a commodity in Rabah, there's a commodity that's underpinning a transaction. In this case, where you only have the rights to something, you don't have really the real asset in your possession, not even indirectly through a lease, say, or, or head lease, or a long lease, or what have you. So it's a case of just having the rights and, and, and nothing else. So that by itself created a, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, food for thought, let's say, uh, as to how do you build a typical uh, Islamic structure or something like this. Doing an ijara became less possible because an ijara, by definition, has to be underpinned by an asset of, of, of certain shape and form, well identified. It was determined that, uh, and there was a debate around that, uh, and that's again not a scholarly matter, uh, that a, uh, an intangible asset like the rights to use something, which are, I think most of us here in this room would recognize them as a very important and meaningful asset, it was it was recognized as not being able to constitute the subject matter of, of, of an ijara. I think with, with many people in the room, we can have a debate, uh, a lively one, about how this can be or cannot be, but this was a scholarly opinion on that matter. So what did we do? We ended up having to be more creative. We, uh, in close cooperation with the National Commercial Bank, NCB of Saudi Arabia, who were also working very closely to this, and who were the Sharia advisor on this, working with us as financial advisors of the uh, for, for the uh, bidding consortium, the winning consortium, in this case. Uh, we there was a lot of back and forth, and the idea came about to create because we couldn't use an ijara per se to create <coughs> something that is more than management like it is. It could be considered an istismar, it could be considered a wakal. There's no specific pinning down of that, of what we've used in terms of giving it a specific terminology so far as I have always understood it. Uh, it was a case of still having uh, an istisna, which is the backbone of the of project financing and Sharia compliant project financing, and the istisna will, 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 will form the basis 
uh, through which the actual debt is dispersed down to the borrower. And on the other hand, the debt service, as it were, over a long period of time, because this is 18-year debt, the debt service over a long period of time is facilitated or enabled through a man what is a management agreement, whereby the actual uh, borrower, which is a project company, will act as the manager of the project for the banks who financed it through an SSN agreement. And for that, the, uh, the bank uh, will be receiving under this management agreement, will, will effectively allow the manager to keep anything beyond a certain predetermined uh, profit distribution that the manager should submit back to the financier in the first place, which in this case are the banks. Okay. There are lots of uh, smaller details that accompany this. We probably not, uh, this is not the, 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 the forum for to get into all the details, but this is just an illustration to talk about a couple of interesting facts, where, which, which are very characteristic of infrastructure developments. Infrastructure development in many parts of the world will further and further take place using some form of partnership between the public and the private sector. Uh, there are opponents and there are uh, people who load it and people who don't really like it, but this is being established as a preferred method in many places of the world. Definitely in the UK, potentially could be considered the birthplace of that. So as, as we see more and more of these structures evolving around the world, as far as and the, the Islamic finance response to these structures, needs to create to involve some element of creativity uh, again i refer to the debate that was taken that was taking place yesterday within the framework clearly the parameters of the sharia interpretations as it was said yesterday <coughs> we can't ask the scholars themselves to come and give us a solution for what we're trying to do uh, we can ask we can ask them to consider what is a particular <coughs> setup we think is is, is possible and is compliant uh, according to the parameters they work in. in, in. So this was a case of, of, of a very, uh, very uh, active uh, uh, discussions with a number of scholars, probably the most prominent scholars, I would say, in Saudi Arabia. And uh, it was pretty much agreed that this is a, a viable solution for what is a specific case of having only an intangible asset to work with. Intangible asset not considered uh, good enough, so to speak, or not considered eligible for an ijara, such a matter. What, where do you go from there? Where there is, when there is nothing else left? Uh, I'll go through this. This is what I've been talking about. There was a Islam agreement and a management agreement uh, that, that effectively created the engine parts of this particular Islamic uh, transaction. Lessons learned is, again, what I've been talking about is how do you try to, in the absence of real assets which are essential, yes, some people could say you can do a commodity model, but that was probably not going to happen, it's too far uh, how do, what, the, what are you left with in order to still create a working some kind of structure? And it also opened the door to think about other ways. I mean, we're not saying this is the only way to do it. Other ways whereby you can quantify potentially. I'm not going to go through this uh, at length. Uh, where you can quantify an, a, a, an activity unit of a certain business you try to create. And you have the financiers pre-buy those activity units and then uh, appoint the uh, project company as the agent to sell on these, these, uh, these activity units. Those of you who are familiar with the mobile transaction that took place in Saudi Arabia a few years back is considered a landmark in terms of a creative solution is this is roughly based on, on, on that. Uh, so so going taking a step back the Islamic finance and, and project finance why why is it attractive? For many lenders it's attractive uh, because of uh, the asset quality mainly that comes with it and the fact that in many countries there is a lot of support for Islamic banks coming and supporting these large national projects. For borrower obviously in certain cases and certain uh, parts of the world it's, it's one way of optimizing the liquidity and optimizing the terms that come with this liquidity. Uh, let's skip through this. I'll just stop for a second here. Saudi Arabia is a very unique case 
who are buying the Saudi banks themselves. All of them, all the nine or ten, ten Saudi banks today, uh, not all of them are Islamic banks per se, but uh, in World Project Finance, the, the majority of them would prefer any day to do their financing in a Sharia compliant manner. So this is a case of a particular country where the Islamic finance uh, uh, way is a common denominator between all banks. And it's definitely the way to optimize liquidity if you're looking to raise the money for a large project. Stopping back at the UK, as I, as I started by saying, there is thinking uh, at official level in the UK of, uh, and again, following that the encouraging announcement that of the UK sovereign school as to how Islamic finance can come and play a role in UK infrastructure. Uh, is it that there are there are issues there? Uh, typically speaking, outside national national <coughs> markets, that's like in the case of Saudi Arabia, uh, Islamic banks haven't been known to prefer long tenants associated with infrastructure projects. Definitely, like, like in the UK, where things are done on 20 years or 22 or 23 years. <laughs> there should be other ways. There should be more other intermediate ways to 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 to, to inch in or ease in. Uh, Sharia compliant financing into UK infrastructure projects. Uh, we do hope that with the uh, with the uh, large announcement uh, concerning the UK Sukuk, this will, even if it's indirectly, will open the door for further interest from the Islamic centres uh, to come and look at other assets in the UK specifically. Definitely the infrastructure area in this particular country would, should be viewed as, as a high quality attractive asset uh, and hopefully this will uh, trickle in uh, further development. Uh, where, would, where do we go from here? I, I would say again, I'll, what I was saying at the beginning, this is here to stay. This is an important component of project financing for infrastructure development at large. We hope to start seeing more sukuk playing up, uh, potentially a contagion coming from Malaysia would be very beneficial. And uh, hopefully also the, the, just a little bit in red at the bottom, we could see more the, the growth in the takaful industry, which will also lead by definition, because it's an insurance-like industry, by definition will lead to the, to the creation or to a higher demand being created for high quality sukuks, and that again will link in into infrastructure where typically you do find higher, relatively high quality assets. So we would like to think, or we'd like to be optimistically thinking that uh, uh, the development in the takaful industry will loop back into further developments of Islamic finance instruments in the infrastructure uh, sector. Oh, shall we? That's it for now. Um, just so I leave it to you as well. Finally, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Janake, and Dr. Janake will handle the question and answer session after his presentation. Okay. And good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for attending this session. Uh, before I start, I'd also like to thank the organizers for, I'm sure what will be remembered as a very memorable and magnificent event for London. Um, in choosing the topic that I have, uh, I've tried to uh, match what um, a pure Sharia compliant financing bank in London offers uh, in terms of capital markets. Uh, what uh, Walid and Gillian spoke is uh, largely <coughs> what we often hear and makes the headlines in the capital markets for the Islam report, the big sukhooks, the governments, the large infrastructure projects. But uh, in terms of number of clients for our sector, that's a rather small percentage of our clients. Most of the Islamic banking clients are big caps. And these are, anywhere you go in the world, the engines of the growth in the economies. These are the companies that need financing, need access, and uh, for various reasons, uh, whether it's faith or whether it's uh, access to an alternative area of finance, approach our institutions. And they have a particular requirement. And um, what I'm trying to bring out, uh, viewpoints uh, from uh, 
uh, Bank of London Middle East, which is a sugar compliant bank in London, is that offer from a sugar compliant bank. So, um, I've got to cover four things. Uh, just a small introductory uh, slides uh, to introduce our landscape a little, and uh, some of the products that are available for the mid-caps in this market. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about securitization, but really the bulk of my uh, presentation will be on a particular case study in which we played a small role. So, uh, most people in banking will be familiar with uh, the range of instruments that are available uh, for uh, medium capital market uh, uh, companies. In the UK, uh, the high yield bond market in the conventional sense is where the uh, most uh, mid caps tend to tap the market. Um, this, uh, there's a trade off for that. So, I mean, uh, capital markets largely are suitable for large issues, for large companies that are rated to tap the market based on that recognition of rating. <coughs> Uh, but there is a set of costs for that, and that's uh, sort of volume value deal uh, applies when you go into the market with a benchmark issue. When you're a mid cap, you don't need 500 million in one ticket. So uh, you need to um, look at a small issue, and what were the trade offs for that? Well, high yield bonds, you pay off with a high uh, coupon, as it name implies. With debentures, you end up giving your security, and that sometimes uh, needs to work in tandem with your banking. Uh, uh, products all through the private placement market and uh, private placement uh, effectively gets rid of the cost of listing not to benefit of Jillian here but um, it, there is a market in that and uh, the important thing is that um, um, and, and we're also familiar with PREF shares and equities which are also uh, in the capital markets uh, arena but uh, the Islamic market has broadly reflected these uh, products as well uh, so cooks, uh, which are largely an asset-backed instrument, a form of security, are now well established. We, uh, we have the more uh, generally available so cook, which uh, tend to be tied to uh, a purchase agreement where effectively at the end of the life of so cook, you create a debt obligation and get repaid. Or uh, <coughs> some true uh, securitization forms where there is a real sale of the asset. And that uh, sale of the asset is akin to an ABS product. More recently, we've seen the uh, advent of perpetual sukuks, which uh, to a European investor looks like a form of uh, pressure or uh, a long-term uh, perpetuity investment, and of course the equities. Just uh, sharing some um, stats, um, as usual in this, uh, and I'm looking at GCC mainly, uh, BLE uh, is uh, an investment by uh, large institutional Kuwaiti investors. We do look at the uh, Middle East as a key market for us. And uh, uh, many of the dollar issues uh, arise uh, from this, these markets. This is not to uh, understate the importance of the Malaysian uh, market. Um, if I were to include that, it will dwarf some of these numbers. But uh, I think the key statistic from this slide is that uh, uh, corporate issues are still a very small percentage, uh, about a quarter. So majority of the Sukuk market is dominated by the sovereigns. But even if you look at within the corporate market, you see the government-related entities uh, with the large projects, like the ones that uh, Wally mentioned, for example, in the power sector uh, or um, infrastructure like the metro or the tourism. And uh, these uh, projects dominate. So some of, and, and of course, uh, what we're trying to look at is um, projects that are really truly uh, helping the independent uh, corporates. We think that these markets, uh, you find that uh, the number of securitization, and by securitization I really mean the ABS market and the MDS market, is a very, very small percentage of that. Uh, in the last decade, uh, the statistic that I'm offered uh, it just basically lists about a dozen uh, true securitization. And uh, about half of these are Islamic, the other half are mainly conventional. And what, uh, uh, the, the reason for that is that by its nature, securitization tends to carry a more complex structure. And uh, uh, to, to be able to attract investors, 
uh, to these structures is a hair do in itself. I think the second uh, element within that is uh, if you are more used to uh, corporate lending and financing according to the strength of the corporate covenants, but securitization is exactly the opposite of that because you're uh, ending up to rely more on assets and uh, look deeper in the underlying assets that actually return uh, the yield to you. So uh, this non-recourse element and off-balance sheet element of it uh, means that you need to take a totally different perspective from credit uh, to these instruments. And th that sort of um, knowledge and understanding is still um, uh, something that uh, requires more expertise, and that is uh, developing. And I think the third area is the rules and regulations uh, within the GCC markets generally. Uh, in more advanced economies, uh, uh, the trust laws and the ability to uh, transfer assets and still protect the investor's interest are much more developed. And you, you still see with many securitization programs uh, the use of English law and the use of the trust laws transferred to um, uh, jurisdictions that allow the uh, investors to be protected. Uh, these factors still exist and we still, despite not having tax, uh, as such a big issue in the Middle East, we still require uh, the uh, governance of English law to make some of these structures work. And again, it's another hurdle for investors to become more comfortable with. So, um, it is not as straightforward as a domestic issue as a hook, but nevertheless the precedent for it, because it is such a widely established product in the West, hopefully should be a roadmap for many to look at and follow. And I'm going to obviously give you an example of that in a moment. So, in terms of securitization, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, here's a list. Um, it, the product generally um, looks at what the company has that uh, is uh, happy to give to other investors of a particular value. So, uh, a building, uh, it could be your high quality receivables, uh, it could be a particular asset that uh, you're happy to put uh, off balance sheet. So leasing companies could use this, uh, companies that uh, have real estate investments could use this, and companies who have large uh, um, client base in terms of receivables could, could use this. So um, it, it allows the companies to raise fund finance without recourse. It allows uh, non-breach of banking covenants. Uh, it, uh, it, it allows the instrument itself to be rated without the company being rated. And these sort of uh, uh, small features um, uh, mean that uh, a small part uh, can be ring-fenced and uh, uh, offered to the market. It also can be tranched as uh, most bonds can, but most importantly, it diversifies your funding source because the investors in these types of instruments are different uh, hopefully, to your banks. The disadvantages I've already mentioned uh, about the uh, need of the SPV and trusts, but also because you are ring-fencing and putting assets into a particular structure, you require third-party administration, which adds another layer of cost. Most importantly, and I think this is the bit that uh, fits Sharia uh, quite well, is the fact that there's a true sell. And uh, in, in creating the true sell, uh, the investors uh, get the benefits of the income from the asset. And uh, I think this is, this is completely in accordance with what the Sharia principle is going to be. Now, I'm going to move on to my case study. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, I, we played a small part in this, but uh, it's, uh, I think it uh, depicts very well the example of uh, uh, how uh, Islamic capital markets can actually help a mid-cap uh, mid uh, company. <coughs> now, those of you who are familiar with the Kuwaiti market or uh, visited Kuwait uh, may have come across the al name. lane. They're the Chevy dealers. They're everywhere, if you like American cars. And uh, al in uh, Kuwait is a uh, fairly well-established family business, as many Middle Eastern businesses are. Um, they effectively are distributors for many brands in Kuwait, uh, not just Chevy, but uh, through their consumer uh, electricals and furniture. Uh, they offer uh, fridges, um, computers, and other things that uh, uh, effectively make, uh, uh, make a retail uh, offer. Um, as part of this, and uh, to support their business, uh, 
uh, and they're more than 40 years old. Uh, they, they started offering consumer finance. And um, this makes uh, their products, a fridge or a, a sofa, uh, if you set it in installments, uh, more affordable. Uh, especially if you look at the GCC population, it's a very large immigrant population. Uh, the sort of the mid uh, uh, salary uh, white collar workers that uh, need to buy these things and they tend to buy them on installments. Typical contract about two to three years, typical payments about 20 to 30 KVs per month type of product. And these installment sales uh, effectively become the consumer financing uh, receivables. Um, Albanian uh, uh, were one of the pioneers of this in. Kuwait in offering this, they're actually, for this particular activity, they're regulated by the Central Bank of uh, Kuwait. This model, by the way, is quite common uh, in other GCC countries as well, and it's not uh, peculiar to Kuwait. Although in Kuwait, uh, the credit checking and the legislation that uh, underpins this um, is, is already in place. So why did Alghani wanted to do this? Well, um, the story of mid-caps in the UK is actually uh, all over the world. What happened after the banking crisis uh, was that uh, banks uh, pulled back and uh, held their liquidity, but more importantly offered it to their better clients because they still had to do business, and that starved the mid-caps and the smaller uh, enterprises of credit. And uh, uh, it was one of these things, never again put all your eggs in one basket. And strategically, and this is the important thing, uh, I decided that over the long period, and starting with this particular program, they don't want to be entirely reliant on bank funding. <coughs> and they wanted a small proportion of their balance sheet uh, funded by capital markets. And this, uh, to me, is one of the more forward-thinking, and uh, we have been uh, also in Europe, obviously, but in the Middle East to actually strategically uh, do this. They didn't want to dilute themselves and sell the equity to other people, but decided to actually pay premium and tap the market in an alternative way and establish a track record. So by 2016, you're getting to 20% of their funding, which is around, you know, given the growth and everything, about 100 to 150 million dollar uh, of um, uh, borrowing through uh, in, in Islamic capital markets. So let me give you a quick uh, overview of the transaction. A um, number of parties involved in this, as usual, uh, with uh, most uh, funding. The lead arranger and the creator of the idea was uh, Rasmiel Structured Finance, a Kuwaiti investment bank. The delegate, uh, Citibank, uh, who managed all of the structure as uh, cash flows uh, on behalf of the investors. Obviously, Afghanim uh, play a role in this, and I'm going to come on to the structure in a minute because not only they're just benefiting from the funds, they're also playing an active part in managing uh, as a, uh, uh, as a uh, wakil uh, in the <coughs> transaction. BLME was basically a placement agent um, and trying to, uh, and we did successfully uh, place the uh, security with other investors. So the transaction is a fixed rate transaction. Uh, in this transaction, the underlying assets are actually <coughs> installment sales, a more rather hard contract. In fact, al uh, managed to uh, create and originate uh, contracts based on Morabaha uh, from uh, their installment sales for the purpose of this exercise. So the underlying consumer finance contract is a Morabaha uh, contract. And uh, they, they raised about uh, 15 million KVs uh, within their uh, program this way. But um, uh, the, the, the whole purpose was to build this uh, through a warehousing facility and then transfer it and refinance it using a sukuk. Um, I've listed two um, classes here. Uh, one's a class A tranche and a class B tranche. And there's a whole purpose for this. The, the, this being a debut issue, it had to be a no-fail issue. Um, so uh, the way we did this uh, was uh, to make sure there are sufficient credit enhancements built within the structure that so the investors uh, could take reliance on overcapitalization and also uh, to see a clear exit uh, within the structure. And that uh, package uh, meant that uh, uh, for this debut issue, Alvanen uh, made sure that there's a subordinated tranche, which is the class B, 
within this, that uh, in the waterfall of payments, always make sure that the senior tranche, which is the wider investment tranche, uh, is paid first. So they effectively uh, offered over collateralization by buying the B tranche themselves <coughs> and making sure that they're always subordinated. It's an attractive product. Um, it pays 6% per annum. Uh, it has a weighted average life of nine months because these receivables, as I mentioned, they're averaging around 18 to two months or two years paying. And uh, that amortizes. So the investors are not sitting with a time bomb of what's going to happen in the next. Just in terms of um, uh, capital structure, what you see is that this uh, senior tranche uh, is effectively 50% over collateralized because uh, while we're getting 6% return as investors, uh, the consumer finance receivables, as you see in most countries, uh, are not quite credit card rates, but uh, they attract uh, at least 15 to 20% type of uh, return. And these installments are structured uh, such that uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, money is due and payable back under the Moravaha because it's a different sale product. And that excess spread is pulled and captured first to be paid investors. And then any surplus uh, is uh, channeled back to the um, to the company itself. So I, I did mention the amortization. Uh, this is a uh, graphic representation of how quickly that pays down. Um, so in terms of cash flows, I, I mentioned there's a warehousing uh, facility within that. Uh, a number of um, uh, banks or uh, investors effectively fund a warehousing vehicle. Um, and that warehousing vehicle uh, uh, is gradually drawn down to effectively acquire these uh, assets. The, the, the basis of it is, uh, is a Wakala investment <coughs> and a restricted uh, Wakala basis. And uh, the warehousing line is used to uh, invest in acquiring these assets into what will become a future issuer of Sukuk. The, um, once the uh, Sukuk assets are acquired, then uh, Sukuk investors, uh, through a Cayman entity, um, effectively become uh, subscribers uh, to a Wakala investment. And uh, that Wakala investment effectively uh, issues uh, Sukuks by uh, taking ownership of the, uh, effectively the receivable pool. It's not just the receivable pool. Um, the um, Part of the uh, uh, transaction also includes assets, uh, basically uh, the underlying goods as well. So it's about 30% asset cover and then 70% uh, uh, of the receivables. But these assets are always available for generating new receivables and are replenished under contract uh, by al -Ghani. So al -Ghani in this uh, transaction actually plays uh, an important role and as you see from uh, uh, the diagram I've drawn here uh, in the far uh, left hand side, Yas is actually a, a, an administrator and collector of receivables. The commingling is managed uh, through separate accounts, and Citibank or the delegate manage the accounts on behalf of the investors. Um, the, the nature uh, of the contract. Um, means that uh, through the mixture of underlying assets and Morabaha, uh, this uh, Sukuk uh, theoretically is a tradable instrument. But in fact, uh, like most commercial paper and short-term paper, it is a buy-to-hold strategy for most investors. And just talking about the distribution, because that's where we play the part, uh, when we uh, approach the market, uh, the yield on this is exactly the sort of uh, product that high yield funds would be attracted to. It's not a rated instrument, so we didn't pay the premium for rating, neither did we pay a premium for listing it. And to manage the um, uh, costs, uh, this can only be made into a program. So once you've established it, what you want is to keep repeating the cycle uh, every six months and uh, pumping more uh, assets into the uh, program in order to be able to leverage and get the overall uh, uh, financing for the business. That concludes my uh, presentation and uh
uh, case study. Uh, I invite you to all ask questions from members of the panel, uh, which uh, I think all giving you a slightly different uh, take on what London can do in Islamic capital markets. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, please. In your presentation, you mentioned that the tenure of the facility for Medina project was 18 years, if I recall correctly. Who were the typical investors, uh, type of investors for that facility? This is a bank deal. This is a bank deal. So we're talking about talking about the senior bank, the, the senior project finance bank. That so the, uh, the the investors that you're referring to in that case for the debt side are all banks. Banks which would have appetite for 18 year funding. Absolutely. And that's what I was referring to at the very end. In, in the case of Saudi Arabia, it's a very specific case, it's a very strong local banking sector which can do these things. Uh, we're trying to see how this similar appetite can be transported to other places or other sectors or other countries. And, and maybe the UK infrastructure that could be the best case. Thank you, just a question for me. Uh, just follow on to the first question. You mentioned the <coughs> manager keeps the upside, what's all the piece of the upside? Mm. Well, what happened in the case of a shortfall? Yeah, it's a good question. The, the manager in the, in, in the structure I was describing, uh, the manager is in a position, if you want, whereby they're managing the project for the financiers, i.e. they're building it, maintaining it, running it, collecting its revenue, and everything. That's the manager. This is an airport. Uh, whilst they're doing this, they need, as per agreement with the financiers, they need to give them, give them the pay to the financier a certain rate, which mirrors the price of the debt. Okay. Whatever is left, and that's undefined, it's kind of business, is left for them. Now, if there isn't, actually, and this is a, a, a great example of where Sharia compliance or, or Islamic finance in a larger sense, Meets, line, meets very well or, or gels very well with project finance, but if you don't, it means the project is not going to work, and by definition, it's project finance. And the conventional project financing work, if I'm lending to a project company, I'm only, uh, I'm only linking my debt service to the performance of that project. So in this case, it's the same thing. Perhaps uh, both Walid and uh, Dr. Masood would like to address the question. On Walid's first slide, you showed the rate of participation of the Islamic finance sector in project finance. You were optimistic, but I felt pessimistic. And the pessimism was that below $5 billion in volume, it seems that the quantum of Islamic finance is approaching parity with conventional. But the much larger volumes in prior <coughs> years, Islamic finance was still quite small. What's the tipping point to make Islamic finance more meaningful? In other words, if we get to $10 billion of, of demand, will Islamic finance still be just producing $4.5 <coughs> billion? No, if, if I may just say something, Pastor so specifically, I mean, this is more a case of showing the proportion. Regardless of whether it's five or ten or fifteen or two. But what about the capacity? Potentially, what this is about is, is maybe less so the capacity is more about the role being played given what's being offered. Because ultimately, it's not really the Islamic financiers, Islamic banks in this case, who would have a, uh, a say or who would who would drive the the uh, uh, volume of projects. They will only react to the volume of projects. And I think we're seeing a case whereby in the GCC today, they're reacting by financing 
or by providing half of the project finance that's going into these projects. The, and, and it's fair to say that when we talk about uh, GCC uh, Islamic financing in projects, <coughs> it's not necessarily only Islamic banks. It's again, I refer back to one of my slides, like in the case of Saudi Arabia, non-Islamic banks in Saudi Arabia are also doing part of that financing. So it's more of a common denominator between all banks where we can optimize your liquidity by using an Islamic product. I think the, the, the one point that I would add to that is uh, clearly uh, it touches on investor appetite. And uh, Islamic finance is still a relatively young uh, industry compared to the conventional and more established uh, uh, banking and financial institution markets. So um, whereby um, a bank like uh, SNBC or others that are active in uh, project finance uh, would have a ready market for placing uh, their uh, commercial debt positions with uh, large uh, insurance companies and other institutions. That market is still not well established in Islamic finance. I wish it was. Uh, I, I wish there were many, many more takaful companies that could uh, invest in long-term 20-year money, uh, but there aren't. And I think uh, whilst we're playing that catch-up, uh, these early steps, and I don't mind whether it's 1 billion or 10 billion, um, uh, for it to happen so that more and more of this uh, type of investment is actually allowed for. Well, I always think, I think uh, Islamic banking is only a very small step. The, the real business is offering pensions to Muslims yeah. and offering other investment products to Muslims that allows them to have a really, truly uh, safeguard for the future. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Zakir and I'm from Bangladesh. I have a stupid question. This is <laughs> well, infrastructure is basically in a country like Bangladesh, in the second semester, basically it's a business of the government, you know. And uh, uh, capital market and infrastructure, can you please uh, mention a few examples of uh, modality of financing for infrastructure? Because Infrastructure financing is heavily influenced by the, sometimes by the political situation, you know, and government is involved, and how do you see the private-public partnership in that process? Thank you very much. Sure. I'll say a few words. Uh, it's not a secret question, obviously. Uh, potentially, we can spend two hours talking about this, but if I, I don't know, there's a two-minute capsule for this. Uh, it, what you started by saying that in many cases, which is more the classical case, you know, if the infrastructure building in terms of roads and water and electricity and airports and they, uh, are typically uh, the, the job for government to just build it, spend on it and, and make it available. Uh, there are different ways of, of looking at this. And the governments may have budgetary constraints that doesn't allow them to just Enable to, to make available a certain facility or utility, <coughs> so they cooperate with the public sector, uh, private sector in this case, uh, for a concession for somebody else to make it and build it and return it to the government at the later stage. So, so that's it. Clearly, it it it, uh, it connects a lot with political issues. That that, that that's clear. But ultimately, uh, I think. Personally, I believe in a lot of merits of the PPP system if it's done correctly. Specifically, uh, you mentioned the case of Bangladesh, there are many other cases when the utility is or the infrastructure is completely absent. Uh, you can uh, take a stand and say, I'll only accept if the government builds a particular water facility here, because if the private uh, sector were to build it, there will be additional expenses which are the profits of the private sector could be true on the face of it, but then you may wait another 20 years and no utility will be built. So it's also a, a balance to strike between what is uh, available, what is possible, and the, ultimately the benefit for the people. And clearly the government stays in the game because they are supposed to be the regulator of these utilities, even if the investors are private investors. to attract project finance to countries by bringing and allowing investors to come in and feel free about investing in these countries. A lot of Middle Eastern countries where the ownership is still uh, a right for the citizens of uh, the Middle East, uh, 
availability of project finance and investing into these countries does not allow the same platform that we would probably have in the UK through a PPP structure. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is uh, there's a long legacy in the UK for foreign direct investment to come into this country and invest in the UK infrastructure without any fear that uh, there's any ownership issue or uh, at least they know the risk they're taking is a risk on the project and not risk on other regulatory activities. Whereas in a lot of uh, emerging markets, we still have this legislation gap to allow free investment of uh, project financing activity in the nature that uh, exists in the uh, Western economies to take place. London Underground were uh, invested by Americans many, many years ago. So th especially in this country, we have that legacy uh, to allow foreign direct investment to do project financing. <coughs> question of Virginia, who's a bit left out so far, <laughs> just to ask. Um, you talked about the issuance by the UK government of uh, issuance, um, and potentially the retail bond market may offer an opportunity uh, at some later point for that as well. Uh, there obviously there's some significant difference between the current retail bonds available on that marketplace that LSC provide um, and what a secret issuance would mean. How does LSC support the education need behind that for the retail <coughs> investor? And also, the uh, second part of the question is, Many of those issuances currently, on the conventional issuances, don't have credit ratings because of the nature of one. Will that be a problem for secret issuance, or do you think that could be a potential advantage? Um, for, for corporates looking to, to issue subgroup, I think that's one of the flexibilities of the retail bond market. It's not essential to have a rating. Um, and we've not required a rating because it tends to be medium sized companies that come to that market. There are a number of reasons why. Um, a mid-cap will not seek a credit rating um, and it should never be misinterpreted that it's because it would be a bad credit rating. Um, in terms of size, um, it tends to be that large companies find it easier to, to fit within those credit rating criteria. Um, and the reason why we've not introduced a requirement for credit rating on the retail bond market is purely just not to introduce an additional barrier. Ultimately, it will be driven by investors. Um, and for some issues, investors will require a credit rating. It's actually um, only the new companies that have come to market where there's a, there's a, a prevalence of not using a credit rating, it just tends to be the size of those companies. There's a large range of bonds that we make available for retail investors on that platform which are large blue chips and they do have their credit rating. In terms of the UK government to cook, I mean, that will, that will have the government's um, um, credit rating. Um, and we would, we would make it available on the retail bond pl platform because we think it will be particularly um, of interest to retail investors. And the 200 million sterling size that the government um, has indicated, it fits quite well actually within, within the retail bond market in the size of transactions that we've seen. So we're very keen to make it available in the secondary market for retail investors to participate in because we think there will be, be substantial interest. Well, in the market, yes, really. Hi, my name is Adil from the Swiss Air Network. I have a question for Jillian as well. Um, we talked about the Sharia uh, compliant uh, ETFs in the beginning. My, question, my first question is why do you see the Sharia compliant invest um, ETFs in respect to conventional ETFs going in the next? years we see an advancement in, well, in, in the range of products where, where are we going and that, that's a very good question because what i would say is the take up of islamic etfs and the loss tracking instruments for sharing complaint instruments perhaps hasn't been what we would have expected to be we have a huge liquidity and turnover in conventional etfs on our market many many you know hundreds of products on the market that um, Sharia compliant ETF structure has been relatively slow to be taken up. Now we think there are a number of reasons for that. Many of the Islamic financial institutions are managing their own portfolios, perhaps ETFs don't respond to that. But I think fundamentally it's probably just a question of education. The ETF market in Europe itself, the conventional ETF market, is still relatively new. We're 12 years on the London Stock Exchange of ETFs. It still accounts for a very small proportion of what's represented by the mutual fund industry. 
So there's a lot, there's a lot of potential for growth in conventional ETFs, um, and you know potentially in, in, in jury compliant ETFs and the one. But I would say yes, it, it's it's fair to say. Um, that the take up and the growth and the expansion of sharing the plan ETS perhaps haven't been what we might have expected it to be. What about the education? Um, being able to uh, try to share the plan ETS? Uh, yes, that's a very good point. And I think I realise I, I didn't respond to the point about education, but um, government support and corporate support as well. Um, the London Stock Exchange, because we have such a large institutional market and obviously other very sophisticated investors. Um, we're seeing growing opportunities in, in retail and to, to support that we've been doing a lot in terms of education. So educating investors in retail bonds about what a credit rating means, um, about what to look for um, in, in a bond and with ETS as well. There have actually been changes to the regulation in the UK with the Retail Distribution Review about how funds are distributed to private investors and there we see um, quite a significant increase in interest from any private investors to access the ETF market. So we make a, we take it really as one of our responsibilities at the London Stock Exchange to support investor education. So we make resources available on our website. We just did a, a, a private investor event last week where individual private investors can come and ask the London Stock Exchange questions about products. We've got product experts speaking on panels. So it's all really an iterative process about expanding and the message about how these products work and about what we tell investors we need to look for when they're looking at these products. Yes, I mean, um, that, that's, that will be offered by FTSE, which is part of the London Stock Exchange Group. Um, again, it's responding to investor demand for more Sharia compliant indices, and potentially there will be the, the, the potential for ETFs to be issued on that series of indices. I think we're just in the announcement stage at the moment, but further information will be published in due course, and that will be available on the London Stock Exchange and the FTSE website. But I'm quite happy to, to keep you updated on developments with that index. A month or so, six months? Or? I have to get back to you actually on the timing of when, okay. of when it will be operational. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Uh, we're shown the um, um, mark for uh, the timing of this session. Perhaps one more question and then we can conclude. Thank you. I'd like to ask a question regarding a bit more, let's say, structured operational question. Um, for the Western institutions, do you have like an Islamic bank set up, an Islamic window? How do you actually operate? And do you yourself, especially long the stock exchange, do you have connections with a Sharia board? Um, we would be confused about this and I would be very interested in knowing a bit more. Yes, if I, if I speak to the London Stock Exchange, um, we're a conventional market, we offer a wide range of products, including Islamic financial products. What we don't do is um, any input in terms of whether a product is Sharia compliant, so we don't have any input um, in, in the screen and we don't take any on any role for that. So that would be the issuer with their advisors um, about determining whether a product um, is compliant or not. Yes, I have a proposal. Go ahead. That's the last question. It's not a question, actually, it's a proposal from Bangladesh. You know, so on the left, next two decades, uh, Bangladesh will have decades of infrastructure development. We need infrastructure development because to, you know, attract foreign investment, also local investment, and also to alleviate poverty. So I would like to uh, submit a proposal to the panelists and this uh, distinguished guest present here. That with this forum, can we think about an initiative that can promote the infrastructure projects for those countries where FDI is not going very well? Because if there is an initiative from this forum, then that can create some additional values where the foreign investors can be attracted. For example, in Bangladesh, we, we have political problem, we have a lot of uncertainty, but we are still having 6% annual growth. So I think the forum, if there is an initiative like that, you know, foreign investor needs to see whether the infrastructure project is feasible, feasible one, attractive one for them. So I would uh, request the forum to uh, make a proposal 
in this regard. Then we can really uh, get benefit out of this participation. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a very interesting session and the uh, next session will be on Islamic finance and education.